In a recent interview that Sandy Monroe did with the Tesla lead design team on the Cybertruck, Lars Moravi dropped a real bombshell that I think has gone under the radar, so I want to take a look at it. And basically, it has to do with metal flowing like rivers. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I'm going to take about a three minute section, slightly less than that, out of a one hour interview that Sandy Monroe did with, like I said, the Cybertruck lead design team. Definitely check out the link in the description if you have not seen the video yet because it is well worth watching the whole thing. It is just a treasure trove of amazing facts. But there was one fact, and I'm going to start off by admitting I am not an expert on material design, metal flow, die casting, any of that kind of stuff, but it really, really stuck out in my mind. When I heard Lars say that they're able to do the front giga casting with the same size press that they use for the Model Y giga castings. That was really remarkable and it really, really points to just how amazing what Tesla does, not only by their design engineers, but by their line workers and the fact that they're able to loop and iterate so quickly together because they're physically close by. It's something that is completely different than the standard legacy auto way of building things and it's one of the reasons why Tesla is basically uncatchable by legacy auto. So I'm going to start off by playing the clip in its entirety, and then I'm going to talk about the different pieces of why I think this is so important. Yeah. But this is a big, pretty big casting. It's pretty, I'm, is this, it's uh, not as big as that one. <laughs> um, so is this like 8,000 tons? No, this is actually a 6,500 ton. The rear, Are you kidding the me? The rear is 9,000 tons. Yeah. How? <clears throat> okay, so um, how it's did just you about keep it flow, together? Right? Like you gotta, yeah. like when you think about tonnage, it's about how much metal you're moving within right. the platen size and yeah. how fast you're moving it. But you can restrict that metal flow by like making bad, you know, feeds in bad directions. But when you look at the side, it, it, you know, the flow, we, we, the biscuit comes in through the middle yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah. And then we flow it all out and we do it like a river because like metal wants to, liquid right. metal wants to move like a river. A lot of times when you see these people copying us and maybe I'm giving it away stuff, but they, it's an engineer drew it, right? And they drew triangles yeah. and trusses. Yeah. Right. But. Here at Tesla, we have in-house die designers that sit right next to the guys that are designing the castings and they're going back and forth in simulations so that we can lower the tonnage of the presses we're using by integrating the design of the part into the design of the tool, which is why we don't need necessarily 8,000 ton press for the front. When we started, we thought we would. We right. said, oh, we're gonna need 8,000 tons, but we worked through the team and we actually can make this front one on the same tool, uh, equipment as we make the Model Ys. That's, Not uh, the rear one. That's amazing. The rear one's too big. Yeah, well. It helps the cycle time too, right? Yeah, yeah it does help the cycle time because you get more even cooling across the whole thing. Well, that's the big thing. Cooling and, and warpage. Everybody everybody asks the same question. I mean, how much does this warp? And and I well, said, well, it happens so quickly. It shouldn't warp at all. But yeah, I mean, it's really about how long we cool it in the dye and you let the yeah. skin cool. And then when you pull it out, we don't have straighteners or anything. So how many how many presses are, are pushing these out now? We, uh, we have one for the front and two for the rear. But we, as I said, we have the Model Y ones. Yeah. So we could, we have four oh, of those. We can swap the die, yeah. But we only need two, uh, like, cycle times are down enough to make, you know, 5,000. We only need two presses, one for front and one for rear. So at the end of the day, um, 5,000. I, I, do, you, do you bother with backup tooling then? Yeah, or, we swap the tools yeah, out. Three, so, three uh, sets of die? So if, well, at least two. If we're running one, then we have one backup. Otherwise, we'll have two in and one backup, and we'll re rework the one while we're, you know, running the other two. And you know, when casting machines go down, they go down hard. Yeah. Right. And so you got to get the tool out and get a new one in quick. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we always have a backup die, or it's not even really a backup. It's like we cycle them. Right. We're just yeah. rotating and maintaining them to always. So maintaining, I would have thought. Well, it depends on. I don't know enough about this aluminum to really. I mean, we, we did an analysis on it, but I've never worked with anything quite as exotic as this. Did you know that your personal data is being bought and sold online right now? Yes, behind your back, data brokers are busy passing your data around for profit. And this exposes us all to potential harassment, doxing, phishing scams, and even devastating identity theft. But you and I have the right to stay private and protect our personal data. I know I need to protect my online data and privacy rights, but I've always been too busy, and frankly, I wouldn't know where to start. 
That's where Delete Me, today's sponsor, comes in. Delete Me takes the work out of protecting your online presence by removing you from hundreds of data brokers all year long. It's totally hands off, so you don't have to do a thing after you sign up, which is great for me and my busy lifestyle. Delete Me goes out and finds sites that have your personal data, like phone number, address, email address, and so on, and alerts the broker that you wish to have your data removed from their site. And if there is a particular custom removal request you need, just let Delete me know and it'll take care of that too. Delete Me sends you a privacy report in seven days after you sign up, letting you know what sites had your data and what has been protected. Better yet, Delete Me is a US-based company and does all the work in-house. And Delete Me will monitor these bad actor sites all year long and repeat the removal process as needed. I also love how simple Delete Me is to use. You submit your info, experts search for it online, requests are made to these sites to remove your data, and it works all year long, protecting you from anyone trying to reacquire your data. Be sure to click my link in the description to get 20% off any consumer data protection plan and start feeling safer today. Thanks again to Delete Me for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to click my link in the description to get 20% off any consumer data protection plan. And now let's get back to it. So the first thing you hear is Sandy saying that, is this an 8,000 ton machine? In other words, that they, they need to do that to build the front giga casting on the Cybertruck. And Lars goes, nope, it's a 6,000 ton, which is the same size that they use for the Model Y. Now, not only is that important because it's a smaller machine. I mean, these machines are the size of houses. And so it's a smaller house. It's, it's a two bedroom house instead of a three bedroom house. So it takes up a lot less room and it's a much more efficient process. And it's better if you can do that because again, the, you can have have more of these machines. At the end of the clip, he talks about how they have multiple Model Y machines, which allows them to do the front giga casting for the Cybertruck on those machines and allows them to be able to swap things out when inevitably these dies go bad. And that is also something that's really important to understand. It's not like these dies are just, you know, you, you, you set them and they're working and they work forever. You basically have a limited lifespan. And you also heard Lars say that when they go down, they go down hard, which means that it's not like a soft failure and you're like, oh, we only have another week or something like that, that this thing's going to work. It's like when it stops working, it stops working. And then you don't get those parts out of the giga presses anymore. And you need to be able to get those parts in order to keep the line running. So it's very important to have multiples of these machines. And the fact that they're able to do this on a smaller machine means that you have more multiples because they already have a bunch in the factory. So that's a really big thing. But of course, the part that blew Sandy's mind and he was like, whoa, there's no way that you can do this is because this is a very, very large piece. And when I, I have to say, when I walked through the factory and I looked at these giga castings, the rear was a different story, but the front I was like, oh, they have simplified this so much and it's so beautifully done. And so when I saw this part of the interview that Sandy had, I was not particularly surprised at this because I had looked at the casting and I realized that they had simplified and improved the methodology of what they'd done versus the Model Y casting. Now, could I have told you exactly what it was they'd done? No, because like I said, I'm not an expert in this, but I had noticed it as an, you know, an amateur looking at this. I'd been like, yeah, they've done something to make this simpler. And the basic thing that they've done is they've made the metal flow through the Giga Press more effortlessly. I guess that would be the best way to put it. So if we look at this picture of the Giga Press, at least as I understand it, the metal is actually injected from the middle part. In other words, that sort of like horizontal cross beam. And it flows out through that middle part and up to the sides and it fills in that cavity. And it has to do that in just fractions of a second in order for the metal not to cool down so much that it clogs up everything. And the way that they've done that, as Lars explains, is that the engineer, the design engineer, and the guy on the line, they sat there, the GigaPress people, you know, all of them sat there and they kind of iterated on the design to create something that actually flows like a river. In other words, you don't put blockages in there. You allow the metal to flow like liquid because when you pour it in there, it is a liquid. It just solidifies very, very quickly. And so when we look at the outside from the side, you can see that there are these beautiful sort of like, you know, wavy lines that go through there. Those lines provide structure. You can't just have a completely flat object there or else it won't have an 
enough structure to retain rigidity and to support all the weight and the torques and all of that stuff that have to go on. So it has to have some sort of structure, but Lars says that the traditional design manufacturer thing is to build it in sort of a CAD thing, build it with like triangles and a bunch of meshes, the sort of the way I would build a 3D animated character, but that all of those meshes and everything in those little triangles are little blockage points. They're little places where the metal is going to cease flowing. And what they've done is they've gotten rid of that. So it's very, very smooth with these ridges that stick up and the ridges basically have no blockages. They just have a clear path for the liquid metal to flow through as it's still liquid and it flows through that, then it's pressed and cooled and then taken out and everything. And so it is done very, very rapidly. The metal flows through quickly. It's very, very homogenized. So you don't have parts where it's like kind of blobbing up and things like that. So it's very homogenous and as it cools down, obviously the structure of the crystal is very, very rigid and solid. And this is something that their material science team has, has worked amazingly on. And Sandy even specifically talks about how he was like, this is such an exotic version of aluminum that I don't even know what it is. We broke it down, we did an analysis of it, but we don't even know what it is because they have a material science team that also happens to work at SpaceX as well. And that team is arguably the best material science team on the planet it, and they are able to come up with a material that has the right properties. It flows very, very smoothly and laminarly when it's hot, cools down quickly, has the right crystalline structure as it cools down, you know, so that it doesn't have any places that are weak or liable to crack or anything like that, cools down quickly and then is rigid at that point that you can pull it out and you can put it into place and you don't have to worry about it. And also, as Lars said, they're able to integrate the design of the part, in other words, this whole giga casting, front and rear, into the design of the actual machine that makes the machine. And that's the most important part, because again, remember, you can build a prototype. Anybody, in fact, they did it in 90 days. I believe Franz said that when they built the first Cybertruck, they built the prototype in about 90 days, and, and they were able to build it, and it looked pretty good, and it ran, and all of that kind of stuff. But that's a prototype. In order to crank out hundreds of thousands of these vehicles per year, they have have to be able to do this in extreme efficiency, extreme cost of quality efficiency. In other words, it's perfect when it comes out and you don't have to go back and fix it at the end of the line because something doesn't line up and doesn't match and all of that kind of stuff. That's the biggest reason for the Giga Casting is honestly because it saves all of these parts, right? If you do a bunch of stamped parts and you weld them together and everything, then you, number one, have a whole bunch of robots and a whole bunch of parts that you're having to deal with as opposed to just one part. But number two is they're never exactly aligned line perfectly so that when you get to the end of the line and you have to put it all together, you're like <laughs> kind of moving it around, trying to make it all fit and, and whacking it, literally sometimes whacking it with sledgehammers to make it all fit in there. That is all cost of quality. That is all stuff that slows things down and makes it more expensive. It requires more robots to make it and then more humans at the end to kind of shove it into position. And then the vehicle is never quite as perfect as it would be with this die casting. So this is a perfect example of how you look at this from first principles. You're like, how do you build a car? Not just build a car, but build it as efficiently as possible possible. And then also elsewhere in this video, they talk about the safety aspect. A lot of people have been giving the Cybertruck heck about the safety quality and the fact that it's not going to crush properly and all of that. But these giga castings, as Lars explains, they're all sort of built in. They, what they do is they have kind of small crushable areas in the front and the sort of crush can areas, front and rear of the vehicle. And then the cross members get thicker and thicker and thicker as you get closer and closer to the cab of the vehicle to protect the occupants. So as the vehicle, as the Cybertruck, you know, hits, a solid object or something hits it, rear ends it from behind, either of those situations, it crushes exactly the way they expect it to. And then I spoke to one of the engineers out in front of the you know factory at the end of the day where they had some of the crash test versions of the Cybertruck. And he also showed me how the motor and the batteries and all of that stuff is sort of sledded down so that it drops out of the vehicle. In fact, the, the motor actually drops underneath the batteries as a collision occurs. And so between that and the fact that the crush element elements of the vehicle are designed into the Giga casting. I believe it was Lars in the video that says, actually, that's the easy part now. They've, they've figured it out because the whole thing is cast as one element. They can design it any way that they want to. They can make it so that there's an exact amount of crushing. They can make it so it crushes in a certain way. So it pushes the complicated parts underneath the vehicle. Also, don't forget that we now have steer by wire. So there's no longer a steering column that connects the steering wheel all the way down to the rack and pinion steering system. That thing is a giant javelin. If you 
get into an accident. And, you know, the, the traditional problem is it comes through and it impales a person. So they have to build all sorts of safety mechanisms into that. That no longer is there. That's the biggest safety hazard for the driver is non, no longer existent. So this car, I expect when we get safety ratings, official safety ratings, it is going to be perhaps not safer than the Model S or the Model Y or something like that. But I believe it will be the safest truck by far that has ever been, you know, tested by NHTSA. And finally, let's talk about the number that Lars throws out of 5,000. I believe he's talking about 5,000 of these per week. And that means that they're aiming to produce 5,000 Cybertrucks per week. In other words, I have to do the rear and front giga castings, but they're aiming to produce 5,000 of these per week. And so if you take a couple of weeks of downtime, so basically you say they're working 50 weeks out of the year producing 5,000 of these per week, that gives you 250,000 Cybertrucks, which is exactly on target for what Elon has said they're aiming to produce. Now, are they sandbagging this number? probably because I believe they're going to have two lines. And if they have two of these presses, they don't have to cycle them completely, right? And they have four of the Model Y presses so they can do the front as well. But just take the rear 9,000 ton Giga Press because that's the limiting factor at this point. They only have two of those in the factory, but they do have two. If one of these presses by itself can do 5,000 per week, there's no reason if they're both operational not to let both of them run and maybe do 7,500 per week and then take one down. So averaging, right? So sometimes you're doing 10,000 a week Sometimes you have to take one out of service and you have to fix it or something. But let's say you can average up to 7,500 per week. That pushes you up, you know, into the 300, 350,000 cyber trucks per year range as opposed to 250,000. So it looks like even with the material that they have already and the fact that we have a suspicion that they've got a second cyber truck line running already or being ramped up in Giga Texas as well as the one that we were able to see, you could easily be looking at well over a quarter million of these vehicles per year year once they reach full production. And of course, that lines up really nicely with Joe Tegmeyer's flyovers and seeing the Cybertrucks being built right now and people taking delivery of them right now. There are people who are actually getting deliveries. So it's not like Tesla produced 10 of these vehicles and then said, oh, you know, in July of 2024, we'll start really doing production. No, they actually, when they did this, this, you know, the delivery date, they were for real. <laughs> they were like, this is the beginning of deliveries. We're not going to just pretend. And then six months later, you'll see actual real delivery start. No, they're actually going like, nope, this is the start of deliveries. And even though it says 2024, they're actually already producing them. And some people, including Homar's catalog, are actually getting their orders very, very soon. Don't know exactly when. He's already confirmed his order, put the money down, all of that kind of stuff. But he might very well be getting his truck before 2024. So all of this points to Tesla being in an incredible situation in terms of producing this Cybertruck. This really should strike fear into probably not Rivian because I feel like it's a kind of a different truck from the Cybertruck and they're not trying to produce that many vehicles, but the Ford F-150 Lightning should be quaking in its boots right now because Ford just dropped their estimated production to 80,000 from 160,000 for 2024 and Tesla could easily get up to 75 or 80,000 next year. So Tesla might produce more Cybertrucks next year. It is quite possible. They could produce more Cybertrucks in 2024 than Ford and their F-150 50 Lightning. And that's a pretty terrifying thing for Ford because their F-Series trucks are what keeps the company alive. That is their bread and butter. That's the best-selling vehicle in the United States for like 40 years or something crazy like that. So all of this is ripe to be disrupted and the Cybertruck looks to be able to be produced at a rate that could ramp to 80 plus thousand units next year. And so we could actually see more Cybertrucks built next year and sold, of course, than F-150 Lightnings. And again, that should scare not just Ford, but everybody else in the legacy auto realm. And speaking of that, I will be doing a video specifically on that in the next day or two, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and interesting and thought-provoking. If you have other insights into this, especially if you're a material scientist or an engineer who works on die casting and stuff like that, let me know in the comments. And while you're down there, please do like the video so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon, my YouTube channel, members, and of course, my ex-subscribers. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel in any way that you can. And of course, if you want to join any of the teams, just check out the links in the description. And finally, a big thanks once again to Delete Me for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out my link in the description to get 20% off any data consumer protection plan. And in the meantime, I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.